Sometimes God does surprising things. And a really good example of that is a guy named Gideon. Gideon was like a young adult, and an angel of the Lord comes to Gideon and says, Hail, mighty warrior. But the problem was Gideon wasn't a, a warrior. As a matter of fact, Gideon, in talking to the angel, basically says, I think you got the wrong person. Because Gideon said to the angel, you know, in my family, of all the people in my family, I'm probably the least important person. And if you compare my family to other families in, in this area, our family is probably the least important family. And if you compare our area with all the other areas in the nation, we're probably the least important area. So Gideon thought he was like, of all the people around, he thought he was like at the very, very bottom. And he said, I'm not a mighty warrior. But it turns out, God had an idea. God wanted him to do something. There, he wanted Gideon to, to, to fight a group called the Midianites and get them out of the land. And even that was a surprise. Because you would think if you're supposed to fight, you'd have swords and all, all that kind of stuff. Do you know how Gideon got beat the Midianite army? He had 300 guys against thousands of guys, and all they had for weapons was a horn and a clay pot. And that's how they beat the Midian army, because God can do very surprising things. And that is a great lesson, because sometimes in your life, maybe God's going to do something surprising for you. Just to give you a personal example, you know, uh, back when I was kind of, I was, um, I was, what, my early 50s, and I thought, you know, well, I'm going to just keep working at the high school where I was working at. That's what God wants me to do. And God surprised me, and he said, oh, no, this has been fun, what you've been doing, but now I want you to be a priest. That was a bit of a surprise to me. But look how it worked out. It was great. So if God ever surprises you, you just want to nod your head, just like Gideon wasn't real happy early on, but later he was like, yeah, God, I'm with you. You want to do something surprising? I'm with you. Okay? You can do that, with that if that happens to you. Hope it does, actually. All right? Thanks so much for being with us. Really appreciate your being here. For the adults, I don't know if you would have caught it, the word in the first reading was astounded. The people that were with Peter, Peter and these other people with him, were astounded what God did in that moment. This is not a common story, and if you did not recognize it, you're probably in the majority. This happens, this is the early church, and in order to understand the background, you gotta remember that Peter and these other people, indeed all Jewish people in that day and age, from when they were little, little kids just like these, they had been taught that we are the chosen people of God, and everybody else, Gentiles, are not chosen by God. So there's this really clear distinction, and indeed, a lot of what Jewish people did, the, the dietary laws, the fact that they had the law, Torah, that was just a, one more way for them to realize, yeah, we're God's chosen people. God gave us the law. He didn't give anybody else the law. God is taking care of us by giving us these dietary rules. We're different than other people. And this, then, if you can appreciate that mentality in these guys, it's kind of a long story, but they end up in the house of Cornelius, who is a Gentile. And even that's odd. Jewish people did not generally go into the homes of Gentiles. But they're there, and they're there so that Peter can tell Cornelius and his family about Jesus. And he does. And as he's talking about Jesus, the Holy Spirit descends on these Gentiles, just like it did to the disciples at Pentecost. You know, a real outpouring of the Holy Spirit, and they, it was very obvious to Peter and the other guys that these, God, has, God has blessed these people. God has touched these people. He's baptized them in the Holy Spirit. And they were astonished. If you had talked to them a day or two before and said to him, hey, just sort of academically, do you think it's possible, likely, 
that God would ever give his spirit to Gentiles? I suspect they all would have looked at you and be like, no, probably not. They might have just said, no, there's no way. But God did. God surprised them. And as I mentioned, God surprised Gideon. And, and we, you and I, we just need to get our heads around the fact that sometimes we think that nothing changes. Maybe you were taught that. Maybe you were taught that God never changes. Our faith never changes. The church, Holy Mother Church, never changes. That's not entirely accurate. It is true that God does not change, but that is the a theological issue. That's the essence of God does not change. What you and I have to be reminded of, you can see it if you read through the Bible, is that God reveals himself to us over time. Starts pretty much, I guess the best place to start is with Abraham. And if you were to go back in time and talk to Abraham, what do you know about God? Abraham doesn't have a whole lot. You and I now, we know a lot more. God has revealed so much more to us about his, himself and his will and what we are supposed to do. Things have changed. You want a terrific example of this? Just go back to the Jewish law. There is this thing, you know it. It said, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. That is, it, to put a modern day example to it, if, say, you are in a car accident, somebody else is responsible, and as a result of that accident, you broke your arm. Well, under this law, you were then allowed to go up to them and break their arm, which you and I right now would think, okay, that's just crazy. Like, you would never think to do that. You might call a lawyer, but you're not breaking somebody's arm. And we look at that now and say, well, that's, that's, I can't believe that God ever decreed that. But you have to understand before that time, if you were in that day and age and something happened to you, maybe by some cause, somebody else caused you to break your leg. Well, before God got involved with this, you would probably go to this guy and you wouldn't just break his leg. You'd probably like just kill him and maybe kill his family, maybe burn down his village. There was, no, there was no limit to the revenge, if you will. And so this, this, this law of God put some real limits to what you were allowed to do. But that's not where it stopped, of course. You and I know about Jesus. What's Jesus say about all this stuff? He says, hey, you guys need to give it up. You need to love. You need to love your neighbor. You need to love your enemies. You need to forgive them. So if an accident happens, even if it's their fault, well, yeah, maybe there's some justice that needs to be done or something like that, but for the most part, you need to let that go. You're not getting revenge. That's not what we do anymore. And it's just a great example of how, if you will, this is sort of a moral thing. Morality, if you will, has changed over the years. Some of you would know from your history classes, sadly, the church thought that slavery was a perfectly lovely idea. Didn't think there was a moral issue to that at all. We look back at it now and it's hard to ma imagine that people used the Bible to justify slavery, but they did. But if you are in that day and time, trust me, for a lot, most of those people, they didn't think there was a thing wrong with it. It was quite, under, quite natural. But fortunately now, we understand things more. And we understand that all human beings have the same dignity as, as perhaps we do. And that because of that, we treat people differently now than maybe we would in the past. Be nice if God had revealed all that stuff to us sooner, but God in his wisdom did not. So yeah, there's all this change that goes on and that can be surprising to us because everybody in their day and age, they tend to think, oh, I got it all worked out. Peter in this story, before he is, it's revealed to him by God that Gentiles are good people, Peter would have been like, no, 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 no. This is a cosmic shift for Peter and the people with him and for the early church. But they were fortunate, they were able to keep an open mind 
and see God's hand in it. And therefore, they went with it. As opposed to deciding that, oh no, what I grew up with, what I know, I, that must be right, and I'm going to stick with it. And this is where it does get a little tricky. Because you say, well, how do I know what change is of God and what change is not of God? That's, that's a great question. Because just because someone, say, say some bishop someplace or a group of bishops, just because they offer something, that doesn't mean it is coming from God. That means you and I have to discern it. You and I have to figure out, is this of God or is this just somebody's opinion? Same thing about our personal lives. We have to learn to discern. What does God want for our lives? Sometimes we think, oh, discernment is just about young people who are trying to figure out if they should get married or be a religious sister or brother or a priest. That that's discernment, and that's not true. You and I, all of us here, we really would do well to discern so many things in our lives. Before you go vote, you should discern that. Not voting because of who you like. You would want to ask, okay, God, in this election, this time period, me, this, where I live, all this stuff, I wish to discern your will for that. And you have to be prepared to be surprised. Because maybe you're thinking, oh, well, if I ask God, he'd tell me what I was going to do anyway. Maybe, maybe not. Maybe God will be surprising to you. And so discernment can get, can get tricky because you have to start with an open mind. You have to start with the possibility that God is going to surprise you. That's hard for people. It is hard. So many of us want to start off with, hey, God, I got this idea. You want to just kind of rubber stamp it for me? That would be great. And that's not discernment. That's us trying to be God. And that we're not, that's not our job. So how to discern, I'm afraid that's a topic for another time. I will tell you, though, it's not especially difficult. It just requires that you start with the right attitude. And that attitude is an open mind. You have to start by reminding yourself that God surprises us, surprises us individually, surprises us as a church. And when God does that, we just have to say, okay, God, I may not understand this right now, but if this is really what you want, then that's what we're going to do. Because think of this. If Peter and these guys had been close-minded to the idea that God would reach out to the Gentiles, it is entirely possible that you and I, all of us, we would not be here. The religion that you and I know as Christianity would just be an extension of Judaism. That would be all it is. But they were open. They were open to something that was crazy, change, change, a big change in their understanding of God and faith. And they were open, and you and I are the benefits of that. It's hard to do. But as you start to consider this, especially if you're one of those people who watches church news, that sort of stuff, just keep in mind, maybe what you're reading is something of man, and it's wrong, and that's possible. It might, though, be of God. God might be surprising us in our day and age.